Hi everyone, so today we're going to be talking about haiku um, and we're going to specifically, when talking about this form of poetry, we're going to be specifically looking at haiku that were written um, during and just after the Japanese internment camps during World War II. And if you're not familiar with what happened with those, we'll be talking about it a little bit. Um, you can see I have some links here just to remind myself, but I'll be um, linking those for you on our Blackboard site and also in the YouTube comments for people who aren't in my class and might want to um, learn a little bit more about this. So one of the reasons that I like to do a unit on haiku poetry is that I think this is something that a lot of people are taught when they're in first, second, sometimes third grade, because um, when you're in first or second grade, especially, um, and sometimes, like I said, sometimes third grade, um, the you're learning more about reading. So you're moving beyond the alphabet that you learned in kindergarten and the kind of the simple words and you're learning more um, words and building vocabulary. And because of that, a lot of teachers um, will teach about haiku, very simple haikus, and they use that because it's a way to get students to write and think about the number of syllables in a word because also when you're that age, spelling is quite important. And so what I find when I teach this in my in-person classes, and sometimes in my online classes too, is that a lot of times um, people have heard about haiku when they were younger, and then not so much <laughs> after that. And they haven't kind of returned to looking at that um, type of poetry, and they really haven't studied it as the art form that it is. So the first thing I want to do, I know um, this is coming up in another uh, presentation that I have about imagery in poetry, but we've talked about imagery before. Imagery is anything that is sensory, um, describing the senses. So describing sights, smells, taste, touch, um, and then uh, things that you hear is that weird symbol down in the in the right hand corner. Um, imagery is an important thing to think about when we're looking at haiku because haiku is really based in imagery. So it's poetry that appeals to the five senses. We're going to take a look at a poem um, that does that, that's structured sort of similar to haiku, but it's not a haiku, and then we'll talk about why. So this is called The Piercing Chill I Feel. The piercing chill I feel, my dead wife's comb in our bedroom under my heel. Now, this poem is really rich in imagery. The the chill, um, you can, that's a kinesthetic word that means movement or touch um, the piercing chill and we get the imagery of this man's dead wife's comb um, the bedroom and heel there's not a lot to describe that it's not like our bedroom with the two beds etc etc right um, but we have sort of this this instant picture of this man going through um, this experience. And what's interesting here is that the two adjectives, the descriptive words, are piercing to describe the chill and then um, dead wife's comb. So the dead uh, describes the wife and the dead and wife's describes the comb, who it belongs to. And because of that, um, one of the reasons, it, this is three lines long, <laughs> we'll talk about the form of haiku in a minute, um, that it doesn't have the same syllable pattern that haiku does, but it also has a little bit more room for interpretation. So it might not be considered a haiku. There's also no um, description of nature, which is also one of the requirements of haiku. However, I think what's interesting here is that the piercing chill I have this sort of abstract picture of a person um, looking like they're depressed and in pain over there on the right. Um, the piercing chill doesn't just refer to that feeling under your heel like if you step on a Lego, right? What it's referring to is the, the chill in his heart, the reminder that she's gone. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about traditional haiku and how this sort of fits that pattern and sort of doesn't. 
So if that's not a haiku, what is a haiku? First, <laughs> my title isn't popping up here. Um, it's a pattern of 17 syllables arranged in three lines with a 575 syllable format. Traditional haiku is one stanza of three lines, kind of like the poem we just looked at. Now, I will say this too, and I think I have this later. Um, it's syllables in English. Um, in Japanese, in the original form, a, a syllable isn't quite counted the same. So we actually have a lot more room in English than we do in Japanese to um, to write this type of a poetry. It's almost it, it, as, as one person will look at a couple different uh, types of poetry. They're similar to haiku. And one person created a type because he said that in English, a haiku was sort of cheating because of how we count syllables. But traditionally, they're three lines long. So the poems that you're going to be looking at are not really that that long, but they have quite a big impact even in their shortness. Sometimes with a little bit non-traditional haiku, there are um, multiple three line stanzas. A lot of contemporary writers will write this way. So they have basically um, maybe a, a poem that's three stanzas long. Each one of those stanzas is in the form of a haiku. Haiku often focus on nature. Um, traditionally, that is the subject of the poem. So look for themes of nature and imagery. Um, and this part, now we get into the stuff that you may not have learned. Um, focusing on nature, three lines long, 17 syllables is pretty much where a lot of people leave off. But one of the important things with haiku is that they are linking or contrasting two concrete images. So you have um, two things that we are comparing. This is called a juxtaposition, meaning you're putting two things next to each other um, that might be compared or that might be contrasted. So looking at the similarities if you're comparing, looking at the differences if you're doing the contrast. There's a conceptual break in the poem between the first image and the second. Either Either at the fifth or the twelfth syllable, so either after the first line or after the second line. Haiku are meant to be an instant sensory experience for the reader. If you remember, these are an ancient Japanese art form before photography, right? So you're trying to capture just this one moment in nature, just this one brief moment in your life. It's supposed to be an instant sensory experience. And because they're short, there's no room in the poem for the speaker to discuss feelings or abstract ideas. So in a lyric poem, um, if you listen to the lecture about poetry or the series of lectures about poetry. We talked about lyric poems. Lyric poems express an idea um, or describe a feeling. In haiku, they're even shorter than a lyric and there's no room for that. So a lot of times we don't even have room for interpretation. Now in the poems that I'm going to be giving you, there's a little bit more room for interpretation because of the historical um, experience that these people went through. And um, and we'll talk about that um, when we when we get to those in a minute. There's there's the title. <laughs> OK, so other forms of Japanese poetry that are sort of similar to haiku. One of the ones that I'm giving you does fit into this um, one of these categories. So it's not really a haiku. It's it's a different type. The first is a sendu. Um, there's an R there, but it's pronounced as a D. So it's called a sendu. In Japanese poetry, there are 17 syllables with sort of a break like haiku, but without the seasonal word. So um, structured exactly the same, but not having that focus on nature. A lot of times instead they'll feature people, they'll be humorous, and sometimes um, they they contain more of a metaphor than the haiku might. It's interesting to me because um, you know, they, they look exactly like haiku. And so a lot of times people get um, send you confused with with haiku, but it's quite a it's a different art form. It's sort of like, I don't know if you're thinking about dance, like the difference between contemporary and ballet, right? They look kind of the same, but there are some differences. Another form is called a tanka. Um, some of these are Chinese poetry as well. I know it says Japanese, but uh, 
Tonka is a Japanese form. There's another form like it um, that comes from Chinese. So Asian um, influences in all of these types of poetry. Um, Tonka has the same historic roots as a haiku. In English, it's 31 syllables and five lines. Um, this is actually a form that uh, I had a teacher who had us write these, and she still called them haiku. Um, but they're basically, you know, they're twice the amount of syllables, and it's 57577 is typically how it's divided up. So a lot of times, instead of being that instant sensory experience that the haiku provides, it'll be a little bit more room there for um, feeling, for emotion, for um, interpretation, a little bit more comment on the subject. A loon, um, this is what was developed by um, literature professor Robert Kelly. As I said, Japanese words have more syllables on average than English words do. And they also, they don't call it a syllable, but I don't want to get into kind of the intricacies there. Um, I haven't, I did take a Japanese class a very, very long time ago, and I, I don't remember really any of it. Um, but Essentially, the this professor thought that a, an English haiku was cheating. So he wanted something that was even more sparse, even more instant. Um, and 13 syllables instead of the traditional 17. He called it a loon um, coming from lunar because it's shaped like the crescent moon. So here we have an example. If not for the birds, I'd not know that I cannot fly. You can see that little curve right right here like the crescent moon um and it's an interesting um very very quick thought right that's sort of what it's meant to be and then as i said there's there's more forms too the kinanashi the renga the reku the renku the waka um and there's quite a number of poetry forms from china and japan which restrict the number of syllables the reason that we're looking at haiku for the most part is because um, one of the reasons that many of them have been translated into English, the other reason is that um, they're coming, as I said, out of this historical experience. So um, the Valley Ginsha Haiku Kai was a club in Fresno in California, and it was founded in 1928 by Niji Ozawa. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> Ten years before he and a fellow immigrant, Kyoto Kumura, founded the Delta Genshu Poetry Club in Stockton. So um, it's a at that point in time, there were a number of um, immigrants from Japan who came into California um, a lot in California, um, and and many throughout the country. But there was a large population in California. And so you had these people who had been doing poetry in their home country. And when they came to America, they wanted to keep doing that art form. And so they formed a club where they could meet together and um, write and read poetry. The Valley chapter met for the last time on December 7th, 1941, the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. So at that point, um, Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese who were fighting with um, Germany and Italy in World War II. Um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor brought the United States into that war. And unfortunately, the response to that bombing was to force Japanese Americans from their homes and they were jailed in internment camps. Some were expatriated to Japan, meaning they were sent back to Japan. Um, the videos that I'm going to link for you explain what happened in a lot um, in a lot more detail. One of them is a piece of American propaganda and the American propaganda basically says, we have these camps so that we, you know, most of these people are loyal, but because we can't know and we're at war, we have to protect our country. And they're helping to work for the war effort. So they're put to work doing things like metal work. Um, they're put to work doing things like farming um, to, to get food for the troops, things like that. Um, 
the the other <laughs> videos there's one of pat marita talking about his experiences in these camps um and he talks about how he was taken um from his from his home as a young child the family was split apart so he and his parents went to one camp um his uncle his grandparents went to another camp they had to try to um apply and figure out how they could get the family back together um and and some of these things that went on the the other difficulty too is that when the japanese americans came home their businesses were destroyed or you know no longer there other people had sometimes taken over their homes um and there were signs up saying you know no japanese allowed things of that nature so I just want to show you these pictures to show, show you the scope. These are two different camps. One's in Tui Lake, uh, California. One's in um, Arizona. But you can see these barracks and how widespread this was. Um, how many people were there. And, um, you know, they're still living in, the, in families, but they're in very small quarters. And you can see the, um, the barbed wire fence that's here um, which comes up in a lot of the poems um, many of the poems describe very quickly life in the camp and sort of the devastation of being forced essentially into prison where you're you're only allowed to work jobs that they let you um, and you're told where to live and what to do this is a picture of three boys looking out of the internment camp again the barbed wire and the mountain in the background you can see to the guard tower they were guarded um, by military um, this is uh, a parent and and his child um, on the way to the camp so people were put kind of in box train cars and forced to go on these journeys sometimes they'd go on bus sometimes they'd go by train um, this is a Tui Lake co-op shoe repairing shop. Some of the people were allowed to work, but again, um, as I said, they, they had to be approved for that work. So they tried to almost set up, um, you know, cities. This was going on for several years, right? So um, almost like a town or a city where they tried to have as normal of a life as possible. Um, this is a sign around that time, possibly after. Um, this is a white man's neighborhood, the woman pointing. If you notice that they also, I'm going to try to see if I can zoom in on this. I don't know if you guys will be able to read it. There we go. Um, it's repeated here. And then there's a thing here about whites only and, and no one of, of color as well. Um, this is the type of racism that these people were facing. And when it said, you know, it said 110,000, but that was really at the time about 80% of the Japanese population in our country. So almost a, a, a wide majority, 80 to 90% of people who are Japanese in our country were forced into these camps. Um, this is a piece of uh, a magazine at the time. You can see the picture of the Japanese men here. And then they say Tule Lake. Um, here's the lieutenant colonel in charge of it. Um, at this segregation center are 18,000 Japanese considered disloyal to the U.S. Now, in fact, as you see from this picture, um, many of these are women, children, people who, you know, and even even men who were not disloyal whatsoever, um, but they were accused of this. Now, this is in 1944, so they'd been there about three years by that point. Um, the Japanese above photographed behind a stockade within the Tule Lake Segregation Center at Newell, California, are troublemakers, calling themselves pressure boys. They are fanatically loyal to Japan, along with some 150 other men in the stockade. They were ringleaders in a riot. But what you're talking about, if that is true, the 150 men, um, 18,000 are being kept there because of the actions of 150 who might have agreed with the war effort. So you can see even in a popular magazine for most people um, how this is being spun. 
So the actual experiences of some of the people in the camp, um, the members of that haiku club, um, the poetry writing club that existed in Fresno before all of this took place, I want you to kind of see, um, and I'll provide you a few more, um, some of their writing. Now, some of these have authors and others are anonymous. Rain shower from mountain, quietly soaking barbed wire fence. You can see right here in this very short haiku, rain shower from mountain, quietly soaking, and then the split comes, barbed wire fence. So that's what I mean by the contrast. We have the contrast of the rain shower, the mountain, it's quietly soaking, right? So we have that softness of nature and then con contrasted with the hardness of the barbed wire fence that um, gives you that immediate sensory experience there is a pervasive theme in these poems of the freedom of the na of nature the freedom that we see on the outside and then the um the oppression on the inside and you can imagine in this brief sensory um experience someone looking out beyond the barbed wire fence and seeing um this mountain and the rain and and um the beauty and the freedom in that, and then the barbed wire keeping them back. Even the croaking of frogs. Even the croaking of frogs comes from outside the barbed wire fence. This is our life. Here, um, I'm going to ask, you know, what were... I'm going to ask you in your in your assignment to pick a poem and pick one word that kind of stands out to you and then talk about what the poem means. To me, the word that stands out here is going to sound sort of strange, but this word even. I think a lot of times the croaking or the barbed wire, you know, those uh, that very interesting verb there, croaking, um, the very interesting adjectives, barbed wire. But to me, this word even, um, even the croaking of frogs, comes from outside the barbed wire fence. Even that, even the frogs are allowed to be free and they are able to speak and croak outside of our imprisonment while we are not. Um, and then the, the little quick thing there, this is our life. This is our life. This is our experience. To me, some of these poems, um, you know, they're like pictures showing you bits of their life and building empathy in a way so you kind of feel their experience this is an anonymous poem the daytime moon following a bus summer journey what's interesting to me about this haiku is that um we have this weird daytime moon which everybody knows right that's when you look up in the sky and you can see the <laughs> the moon um in, in its very strange daytime form right no glowing and kind of pale what's interesting about this is that if you didn't know um the historical background you would just say oh okay daytime moon following bus a summer journey kind of maybe like a field trip or something but when you know and that's you know uh, what a haiku does it's just showing you this instant in time and there's no room for interpretation as much in the poem right but if you know that this is their summer journey is going to a detention camp their summer journey is going to prison and they're in this bus looking out at the daytime moon something which seems kind of odd and strange it's not just the sun following them that um then you kind of see um again the the contrast between the moon and that's where sort of the split comes after moon and then the bus um inside again being forced away from their homes so limited to three lines restricted number of syllables the instant sensory experience we get the snapshot of the internment camps here they all have at least one word referring to nature if they did not they'd be a send you um, two contrasting concepts or images and again a turning point or a conceptual break so 
here it comes after that. Um, here we have it here, and here we have it here as well. There's after a certain line, there's a, conceptu a conceptual break, meaning the contrast between nature and then um, what's going on. So what do they mean? Um, basically, this is a little picture that I got online. Um, is there a picture of intolerance? Intolerance. So we have the the white man's neighborhood sign there in the middle. Um, North Carolina law, white patrons only, um, you know, Irish need not apply, help wanted, white only, no Spanish, no Mexicans, um, no Indians, no Negroes, no Mexicans, uh, again, no, no Jews, keeping people out, um, here the water fountain, the white water fountain, which is refrigerated and the one for, um, people who are not white, which is not. Right. Um, this kind of thing uh, kept kept on for the next couple of decades. Um, we talked uh, in another. Um, we talked, or at least I did, uh, in a different lecture about the civil rights movement and some of the literature that. Um, came out of that period of time looking at things like um segregation in my in my contraband the story by louisa may alcott we looked at that again as well and i think that this is sort of the key to these these poems that um at that point people who immigrated here were not allowed to be uh, citizens. So we didn't have the same process that we do now. So being treated as other, being treated as different, being um, not welcome, not wanted, and trying to use writing as a way to say, look, this is a human experience and I am a person and I have the same feelings that you do and I deserve the same rights that you have. Um, and doing this in a very... Um, I can't kind of click out of here now. There we go. Um, doing this in, in the, you know, later on there are protests, but here we have literature that is very um, quiet in a way, quietly protesting um, the treatment and really trying to express the suffering that they are facing. So that is basically what I'd like you to look at when you are um, discussing these poems. I'd like you to pick a couple of them and refer back to this video, refer back to the other videos I'm going to link for you um, about the Japanese internment camps and um, the people who were there. And I hope that you kind of, like with a lot of the literature, but especially with this unit, I really hope that you take away um, a little bit of the history as well as the literature. So that's it. I look forward to reading your responses. Thanks.